I'll use the stage for the cameras. Thank you all for coming out. Um, I'll talk for about 40 or 45 minutes, especially since this is being taped um, for YouTube and C-SPAN. Um, and then we'll have time for questions, and even I could probably take some questions after that offline, if you like. Um, that was a terrific introduction, and it's, it's really wonderful um, for us to be out here today. Um, my first book, which wasn't mentioned, was written in 1990, and it was all about the rise of Silicon Valley. And I've been coming out, it was called The Breakthrough Illusion. And I've been coming out here and studying and working in the Valley for a long, long time. Uh, and then I wrote The Rise of the Creative Class and The Flight of Creative Class, and maybe we'll talk a little bit about them. But the main thing I want to talk about today is, is this new book, Who's Your City? And, you know, I, I've been a professor now for a couple decades, actually since 1984, so the better part of two decades. And I took my PhD in urban planning. And so I've studied cities and regions and places for a long, long time. And I've written books about that. And, and mayors have read the books and talked about them. And economic development officials have talked about them. And even real estate developers have found this to be interesting. And people who study cities. But the one thing that struck me, um, and I've moved two times. My wife and I have moved two times uh, in the past five or six years. We moved from Pittsburgh, where I taught at Carnegie Mellon for nearly 20 years. I'm sure some of you are from Carnegie Mellon or some of your colleagues are from Carnegie Mellon. And then we moved from Washington, D.C. to Toronto. So I began to think about why people move and how we pick the cities we locate in. And then I had a whole bunch of students who, after graduating from places like Carnegie Mellon, were trying to figure out where they wanted to move and how they wanted to organize their lives and their careers and balance that choice. And one day it dawned on me, and, and this is sort of how it came into my mind. When I was a little kid and I grew up in New Jersey, my dad worked in a factory. He only had an eighth grade education. And he, he would say to me, Rich, you have to study hard. You have to get good grades. You have to go to college or university um, because you need to get a good job. And, and, you know, at that time, even when I was young, they had all these stories in, like, magazines and papers about interesting fields to go into. And then when I went to high school, we had this guidance counselor who tried to give you advice, and he told me I'd probably never make it. There was only one or two kids in our Catholic high school who had the ability, but that just motivated me a little harder. But, and, and as I got older, I could see that there was all of this advice about what to do about your job and your career and how important that was. And some of it, you know, quite rudimentary, and it might be on television talk shows. And then I thought about my mom, and my mom, who was a quite sensible woman, and she always said, well, Richard, you need to study hard and get good grades, but realize picking your life, you know, your mate, I don't think we had the word life partner then, picking the woman you marry, which is what my mom would have said, is really, really important because I married your dad. He only had an eighth grade education. He worked really hard in a factory, but for the 40-plus years, nearly 50 years we were married, I was just fantastically happy. It was the greatest decision I made, and we had a family. And then, you know, I know enough about psychology to know that there's a whole, and I'll talk a little bit about this, a whole industry of studies about happiness. And those studies about happiness say, you know, our jobs and our careers can fulfill us, but our social relationships and our family and our children and the friends we have are a key part of what make us have happy and fulfilled lives. And then it dawned on me. So we talk a lot about, and then I read Dan Gilbert's book, and I think Dan gave a talk here. I think I saw it on, on your, and Dan Gilbert's book, Stumbling on Happiness. And he said, there are three big decisions you make in your life that are really important in determining your future and your happiness. Where to live, what to do, and whom to do it with. And the whole book is focused on the what to do and who to do it with. And then I looked, and I found all these books from academic tomes to self-help books on careers. The same thing I felt, you know, everything from, from works of psychology to like Dear Abby and Ann Landers on relationships. And no one had ever written a book about why the place we choose to live is important. And I thought, well, I've been studying this stuff for 25 years. I should do it. So that was about two years ago, and I had already done 20-plus years of research on places. So that's, that's what I want to tell you about, why this decision that we make where to live is one of the 
three most decisions we make in our lives. And in many ways, if you think about, think about your own decision to live in this area, in many ways, it's the most important. And, and, and that's kind of a strong statement, and I want to make that point. But in fact, increasingly, the place we choose to live is not only one of the, these three legs of a triangle, what we do, our jobs and careers, who we marry, our social lives, our relationships, the place we live. In fact, it conditions the other two. Because increasingly, the job and career markets we participate in, and as we'll talk about, the mating markets right that we, we are in, where we meet each other, really differ dramatically by place. So there's three big parts of the book. The first part of the book says why place matters. The second, in general, I'll talk about that. The second part of the book says why it's important to you from a career and jobs perspective. And the third part of the book, which is also, I think, very interesting, talks about why place is important to your life beyond your career and your jobs. And in fact, it says that we make three big decisions about location in our lives that are really, really important. Forty million of us, and we just looked at the new census data, it may be as many as 50 million Americans move every year. So this is a non-trivial number. 15 million of us, and as many as 20 million of us, make a significant move, like most of you made. We're moving uh, out of the county that we currently live in. We're moving from one county to another county. We're moving to another state, or we're moving abroad. That is a huge number, and a minority of our moves are for work. At best, a fifth to a quarter, 20 to 25 percent of our, our moves are for work. There are other factors that matter. Now, now think about this. This is occurring just at the time, if, if you read the newspaper, Financial Times, The Wall Street Journal, San Jose Mercury News, New York Times. And, and if you read academic work, you read the business press, what you guys do, technology, you know this. This is happening at exactly the time when most people would say place and location are supposed to become less important. The rise of wireless, technology, advances in transport, and communication are supposed to make us much more locationally flexible. Um, we can work from a mountaintop in the Rockies. We can work from a ski chalet. We can work from a beach house, you know, in San Diego or in the south of France. There are six billion people, supposedly, that are competing with us. We've seen the articles. And, and not just now. You know, over the course of the 20th century, first it was supposed to be the telegraph and the railroad and then the telephone and the automobile, then the airplane and now wireless, the computer and the internet, these were supposed to free us from the constraints of location. Distance is dead. Place is no longer important. And then the, the most eloquent statement of this, Tom Friedman's fantastic book, The World is Flat. In this new world we live in, the world has become flat. Distance is no longer important. Place no longer matters. You can plug and play from anywhere. In fact, Friedman says in that book, in order to innovate in today's world, you no longer have to emigrate. It's a classic quote in that book. So all these advances in technology are freeing us from the constraints of place. Therefore, location shouldn't be as important, and we should spread out. Well, anyway, being a professor for 25 years, studying at Rutgers and then MIT and Columbia and Carnegie Mellon and now at the University of Toronto, I care something about actual empirical data. So we said, why not take a look at this? Is this true? Is it true that people are becoming more geographically spread out? That's the first part of the book. This year, last year, 2007, is the first year in human history. It's a great milestone. More than 50% of all people on the earth live in urban areas, according to the United Nations. And population is one thing. And if you look around the world and you look at populations, you'll note that we have generated these large, very broad-scale megacities, 5, 10, 20, 30 million in population. Well, there's no place in the world that collects data on not just where people live. You can collect what cities people live in. No place in the world, and you would think the World Bank would have this, or the United Nations would have this, or some interesting consulting firm would have this, but they don't. No one collects data on where economic activity or innovation occurs outside of their nation. So you can get data on the 191 member nations of the United Nations, 
but you can't get it on a smaller scale. 